Hello, and welcome to Screaming in the Cloud with your host, Chief Cloud Economist at the Duckbill Group, Corey Quinn. This weekly show features conversations with people doing interesting work in the world of cloud, thoughtful commentary on the state of the technical world, and ridiculous titles for which Corey refuses to apologize. This is Screaming in the Cloud. This video is sponsored by Teleport. It seems like there's a new security breach every day. Are you confident that an old SSH key or shared admin account isn't going to come back and bite you? Of course you're not, because this isn't your first day working with computers and you're not a dangerous liability to yourself and those around you. Since you're responsible, check out Teleport. Teleport is the easiest, most secure way to access all of your infrastructure. The open source Teleport access plane consolidates everything you need for secure access to your Linux and Windows servers, Kubernetes clusters, databases, and internal applications like the AWS Management Console, that Jenkins box you swore you'd replace three years ago, GitLab because GitHub is just too mainstream, Grafana because to hell with it you're building your own data dog, Jupyter Notebooks because Python dependencies are the devil's work, and more. Teleport's unique approach is that not only more secure, it also improves developer productivity. To learn more, smash the link below and also the like and subscribe buttons while you're mucking around down there and not looking at me like you should be doing. Welcome to Screaming in the Cloud. I'm Corey Quinn. My guest today does something that I sort of dabbled around the fringes of once upon a time but then realized I wasn't particularly good at it and got the hell out of it and went screaming into clouds instead. Ashley Early is the head of sales here at the Duckbill Group. Ashley, thank you for joining me. Thanks for coming on and running screaming from my chosen profession. <laughs> You're definitely well, let's not be the clear here. One. There are two ways that can go because yeah. sure, I used to dabble around in sales when I was basically trying to figure out how not to starve to death. But I also used to run things, basically a small a team. I was run, I was managing people and realized I was bad at that too. So really that that's sort of an open-ended direction. We can go either side in, but let's go with sales. But that seems like a more interesting way for this to play out. So you've been here for, what is it now? It feels like ages, but my awareness of the passing of time in the middle of a global panini is relatively not great. Yeah, I, I think we're at day, what is it? 1,053 of March, 2020. So time is irrelevant. It's a construct. I don't know. Uh, but technically by the Gregorian calendar, I think I'm at six months. It's very odd to me, at least the way that I contextualized doing this. Back when I started what became the Duckbill Group, I was an independent consultant. It was more or less working people I knew through my network who had a very specific, very expensive problem. The AWS bill is too high. And I figured this is, this is genius. It is the easiest possible sale in the world. I'm one of the only scenarios where I can provably demonstrate ROI to a point where, bring me in, you will inherently save money. And all of that is true. But one of the things that I learned very quickly was that even with the easiest sale of, hi, I'd like to sell you this bag of money, there's no such thing as an easy enterprise sale. There is nuance to it. There is a lot of difficulty to it. And I was left with the, I guess, driving question after my first few months of playing this game of how on earth does anyone make money in this space? I mean, the reason I persisted was basically a bunch of people did favors for me that they didn't owe me at all. It was, oh, great, I'll, I'll give them a price quote. And they're like, oh, yeah, so cool. They turned around and quoted that to their boss at triple the rate because don't, don't slit your own throat on this. They were right. And not for nothing, it turns out when you're selling advice, charging more for it makes it likelier to succeed as a project. But I had no idea what I was doing. And like most engineers on Twitter, I look at something I don't understand deeply myself and figure, oh, well, it's not engineering, therefore it's easy. Yeah, it turns out that running a business is humbling across a whole bunch of different axes. I wouldn't even say it's not running a business, it's working with humans. Working with humans is humbling. If you're working with a machine or even something as simple as like, uh, you know, you're just, you're making a product, it's, it's follow a recipe. It's okay. Follow the instructions. I do A, then B, then C, then D, or unless you don't enjoy using the instructions because 
you don't enjoy using instructions, but you still follow a set general process. You build a thing that comes out correctly. When the moment that process is talk to this person, then the person A, then person B, then person C, then person D, then back to person A, then person D, and then finally to person E, everything goes to heck in a handbasket. That's what really makes it interesting. And for those of us who are of a certain disposition, we find that fascinating and enthralling. If you're of another disposition, that's hell on earth. So it's it's a very it's a very yeah it's a very interesting thing. Back when I was independent and people tried to sell me things, and yes, yeah, sometimes it worked. It was always interesting going through various intake funnels and the rest. And like, well, are you what role do you hold in the organization? Do you influence the decision? Do you make the decision? Do, like, how how many people need to be involved in the rest? And I was looking around, going, how many people do you think fit in my home office here? Let's be serious. I mean, there are times I escalated to the Chihuahua because she's unpleasant and annoying, and basically sometimes so are people. But that's a that's a separate topic for later. The but it became a very different story back as the organizational distance between the people that needed to sign off on a sale increased. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and it's you, you hit. You might have seen me. You might have felt me squirm when you started when you described those questions because one of my biggest pet peeves is when people take sales terminology and directly use that with clients. Just like you, if you're an engineer and you're describing what you do, you're not going to go home and explain to your dad in technical jargon what exactly you're going to tell him broad strokes. Um, And then if they're interested, go deeper and deeper, technical, more technical. I hate when salespeople use sales jargon, like, what's your role in the organization? Are you the decision maker? Don't. mm, There are better ways to deal with that. So that's just a sign of, of poor training. It's not the sales rep's fault. It's this company's fault, their company's fault. But that's a different thing. It's... It's fascinating to me kind of watching this, that not what you said spoke of two things there. One is poor training and two of a lack of awareness of the situation and a lack of just doing a little bit of pre-work. Like you do five seconds of research on Corey Quinn, you can realize that the company is 10, 15 people tops. So it makes sense to ask a question around, hey, do you need anyone else to sign off before we can move forward with this project? That tells me if I need to get someone for technical, for budget, for whatever. But asking if you're a decision maker or if you're influencing or if you're doing initial research, like that's using sales terminology, not actually getting to the root of the problem and immediately making it very clear he didn't do any actual research in advance, which is not, in modern selling, not okay. My business partner, Mike, has a CEO job title. And he'll get a whole bunch of cold outreach constantly, all day, every day. I conducted a two-week experiment where in front of my chief cloud economist job title, I put CTO slash just to see what would happen. And sure enough, I started getting outreach left, right, up, down, and sideways, not just for things that a CTO figure might theoretically wind up needing to buy, but also job opportunities for a skill set that I haven't dusted off in a decade. So, okay, once people can have something that hits their filters when you're searching for very specific titles, then you wind up getting a lot more outreach. But if you create a job title that no one sensible would ever pick for themselves, suddenly a lot of that tends to go by the wayside. It, It shined a light on how frustratingly dreary a lot of the sales prospecting work really can be. From just oh, from the yeah. side of someone who sits here and gets it. Now, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say that I did work in sales once upon a time. Not great at it, but one of the first white collar style jobs that I had was telemarketing of all things. And I was spectacular at it because I was fortunate enough to be working on a co-branded affinity credit card that was great. And I had the opportunity to position it as a benefit of an existing membership or something else people already had. I was consistently top 10 out of 400 people on a shift and it was great. But it was also something that was very time limited. And if you're having an off day, everything winds up crumbling and Eventually, I I drifted off and started doing different things, but I've never forgotten those days. And that's why it just grinds my gears both to see crappy sales stuff happening and two, watching people on Twitter, particularly taking various sales prospect outreach for a drag. And it's, you know, 
not everyone is swimming in the ocean of privilege that some of the rest of us are and understand that you're just making yourself look like a jerk when you're taking someone who's relatively early career and didn't happen to Google you deeply enough before sending you an email that you find insulting. That bugs me a fair bit. Yeah, and I think part of that's just a lack of humanity and understanding. Like there's, I mean, I get it. I'm the first person to be jumping on Twitter and Jing when something goes down or something's not working and saying, you know, I'm the first one to get angry and start complaining. Don't get me wrong. However, what I think a lot of people, it's really easy to to dehumanize something you don't see very often or you're not involved in directly. And I find it really interesting. You mentioned you worked in, you know, doing telemarketing. I lasted literally two weeks in telemarketing. I full on rage quit. It was a college job. I worked in my college donation center. I lasted two weeks and I, I fully walked out on a shift. I was like, screw this. I'm never doing anything like that ever again. I hate this. But what I hated about it was I hated the lack of connection. I was like, I'm not going to just read some script and get yelled at for having too much banter. Like, do you want, I'm getting money. What do you care? This is, I'm getting more money than other people. Maybe I'm not making as many calls, but I'm getting just as much. So why do you care how I do this? But what really gets me is you have to remember, and I think a lot of people don't understand how kind of most large modern sales organizations work. And just really quickly giving you a very, very generic explanation, the way a lot of organizations work is they employ something called SDRs or sales development reps. They can That title can be permeated a million different ways. There's ADRs, MDRs, BDRs, whatever. But basically it's their job to do nothing but scour the internet using sometimes actual like scripts. Sometimes they use LinkedIn. Sometimes they have, they purchased um, databases. So for example, like you might change your title on LinkedIn, but it's not changing in the databases. Trust me, Corey, they have you flagged as a CTO. Sorry. My personal you, favorite is when I get cold not. outreach asking me uh, on the phone call about whether we have any needs for whatever it is they happen to be selling at, and then they name a company that I left in 2012. It's, I don't know how often that database has been sold and resold and sold onwards yet again. And it's just, I work in tech. What do you think the odds are that I'm still in the same job I was 10 years ago? I mean, I get that it happens, but at some point it just becomes almost laughable. One of the best descriptions I ever heard from an advisor was that salespeople are sharks, but that's not intended to be uh, unkind. It is, it is simply a facet of their nature. They enjoy the hunt. They enjoy chasing things down and they like playing games. And whereas as soon as you start playing games with your engineers on how much money they're going to make this week, that turns out to be a very negative thing. It's, it's a different mindset. It's about motivating people as whatever, as befits what it is that they want to be doing. It is. And it's also, it, the other thing is, it's, it's a cultural, it's a cultural conditioning. So it, it's really interesting you say, you know, people, you know, playing games. We, we do enjoy, there's, there's, there's definitely some enjoyment of the competition. There's a thrill of the hunt. Absolutely. But at the same time, you want your salespeople to quit, screw with their money. You screw with yeah. our money, we will, we will bail so fast, it'll make your head spin. So it's like, people think, oh, it's the, we love this. It's, no, it's a really, it's really more, think of it as we are, we're gamblers. Yeah. To be clear, when I say playing games with money, I'm talking about the idea of sell to a company in this profile this quarter and we'll throw a $5,000 bonus your way or something like that. It is the, if when you, when you want, the business wants to see something great, make it worth the, worth the sales team's while to pursue it, or don't be surprised when no one really cares that much about those things. It's, exactly. it's all upside. It is not about, <laughs> and if you don't sell to this weird thing that I can't really describe effectively to you, we're going to cut your bet. Yeah, that, that goes over like a lead balloon, as it should. Money, no. my belief is that compensation should always go up, not down. Yeah, no, it, it should. And it's, aside from that, um, here's a fun stat. Um, I believe this, I believe this came out of Forrester, it might have been out of Topo. I apologize. I don't remember exactly who said this, but a recent study found that less than 68% of sales reps make their quota every month. So imagine that where if you're, we have this thing called OTE, which is on target earnings. So if you have this number you're supposed to take home every month, only 68% of sales reps actually do that every month. So that means that we live with this number as our target, but we're living and budgeting anywhere from 30 to 50% below that and then hoping and doing the work that goes from there. That's what we've been conditioned to accept. And that's why you end up with sales reps that are, use terms like shark and are aggressive and are 
in your face and are and can keep it. We call it, I love. I didn't realize it was pejorative. I know. No, but here's the thing too. But somebody called it commission breath, which I love. But it's like you can smell commission breath coming off us when we're desperate. You totally can. It's because of this antiquated way of building commissions, and this is something that I, I it just was really obvious to me, and apparently I was a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, when I started designing comp plans, everyone told me you want to design a comp plan, tie it to what you want them to do very specifically. So if you want them to move a pen, design the comp plan that they get a buck when they put the pen from the heel of your hand to the tips of your fingers. Then they get a buck, and they can just do that repeatedly. That's literally how I was taught to design comp plans. In my head, that meant that I need to design it in such a way that it's doable for my team because I don't want my team worrying about how they're going to put food on the table while they're talking to a client because then they're going to get commission breath and it'll piss off the client. That's not a good client experience. That's not going to lead to good performance. My concerns as a business owner have nothing to do with salespeople making too much money. In fact, I am never happier than I am than paying out commissions. The concern then therefore has to become the, okay, great. How do I keep the salespeople from being inadvertently incentivized to sell something for $10 that costs me $12 to fulfill? It's a, it's a question of what behaviors do you incentivize that align what, what they're motivated by with what the company needs. And very often getting that wrong, which happens from time to time, is is not viewed as a learning experience that it should be, but instead they're just out to screw us. And, and I've seen so many company owners get so annoyed whenever their salespeople outperform. It's, well, what did you expect? That that is That is the positive outcome as opposed to what? The underperforming sales rep who can't close a deal? Please. Well, no, and, let, and, let's, and let's think about this too, especially if it's tied to commission and you're paying out commission. It's like, okay, commission is always some sort of percentage, depending on a lot of different things, but some sort of percentage of what they're bringing in. So if you design a comp plan that has you paying out more in commission than the sales that were earned to bring it in, that's on you. You screwed up and you need to either be honest and say, I screwed up, I can't pay this and know that you're going to lose some sales reps, but you won't lose as many as if you just refuse to pay it. But honestly, and I, I'm not even kidding. I know people. I, I've worked at a company that I happen to know did this, um, that literally fired people because they didn't have the money to pay out the commission. And Oof. because they fired them before the commission was due to be paid out, then that person no longer had a legal claim to it. That's common. Yeah. So the, the, the to commission be clear, goes we've never ways. done that. But I, I also would say yeah. that if we had, that's a screaming red flag for our consultancy, given the nature of what it is that we do here. It turns out that when we're building out comp plans, we model out various scenarios. Like, what is the yeah. worst way that this could wind up uh, wind up unfolding? And okay, in some of our early drafts, it's, yeah, it turns out that we would not be able to pay salaries because we wound up giving all of that in commission to people with an uncapped uh, upside. Okay, great. But we're also not going to cap people's commissions because that winds up being a freaking problem. So how do we wind up motivating in a way that continues to grow and continues to incentivize the behaviors we want? And, yeah, and it turns out it's other, super com- super complicated. It's why we brought you in. It's easier. Yeah, it's, it's a pain. Um, but the other side of this too, I think, is there's another force at play here, which is finance. A lot of traditional finance modeling is built around that 50 to 70% of people hit commission. So if all of a sudden you design a comp plan in such a way that 100% of the team is hitting commission, finance loses their shit. So you have to make sure that when you're designing these things, one of the things I learned, I learned this the hard way. This is how I learned that not everyone does it this way. I built my first comp plan. My team's hitting it. My team's overperforming, not a ton, but we're doing really well. All of a sudden I'm getting called to finance and getting raked over the coals. And they're like, what did you do? And I'm like, what do you mean, what did I do? I designed a comp plan. We're hitting goal. Why are you mad? Well, you were, we only had this much budgeted for commission. And I was like, that's not my fault. Well, that's what historic performance was. Okay, well... That's not what we're going to do going forward. We're going to do this. And they're like, oh, well, you need to notify us if you're going to change it like that. And I was like, wait a minute. You modeled so that my team would not hit OTE. Yes. That's how you've always done this. Yes. Okay, well, that's not what we're going to do going forward. And if that's a problem, I'll go find a door. Because, yeah. no, and especially, especially when we're talking about people who are living in extremely expensive areas. I spent most of my career living and working in San Francisco, managing teams of people who made less than six figures. And that's rough when you're paying two grand in rent every month and 60% of your pay is commission. Like, now you need to know that money's coming. So 
modern, I, I talk about modern sales a lot because I really, that's the word I'm trying to use because there's like the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross kind of Wolf of Wall Street school, which is not how anyone behaves anymore. And if you're in an environment that's like that or that treats your salespeople like that, please leave. Um, and then you've got modern sales, which is all about, okay, let's figure out how we can set up our salespeople to be the best people they can be, to give our clients the best experience they can. That's where you get top performance out of. And that's where you don't, you never run into the terrible emails with the alligators and the clearly you like lighting, you know, piles of money on fire. That's where you don't get emails to Corey Quinn asking him if he's interested in coming to work for AWS, the book company. It's by incentivizing the people and creating good humans where they can really thrive as salespeople and as people in general. The rest comes with time. But it's this whole new way of looking at things. And it's it's big and it's scary and it costs more upfront, but you get more on the back end every single time. Not so. that you care about this an awful lot, but you have your own podcast that talks about this, The Other Side of Sales. What what inspired you to decide not just to build sales teams through a different lens, but also to, you know what, I'm going to go out and talk into microphones to the internet from time to time, which, let's be clear, takes a little bit of a uh, certain warped perspective. I, I say this myself, having done this far too often. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a fun little origin story. Um, so I, I'm a huge Star Trek geek obsessive. And um, I was listening to a Star Trek podcast run by a couple of guys who are a little bit embarrassed to have a star who to run a Star Trek podcast podcast called The uh, Greatest Generation. Um, definitely not safe for work, but a really good podcast if you're into Star Trek at all. Um, and they always do kind of letters at the end of the shows. And one of the letters at the end of a show one day was, hey, I was really inspired by you guys. And I started my own podcast on this random thing that I'm super excited about. And I'm literally driving in the car with my husband. And I'm like, huh, I don't know why I'm not listening to sales podcasts. I listened to enough of these other random ones, jump online, pulled up a list of sales podcasts. And I'm never, I think I went through three or four articles of like every sales podcast that was big. And this was like January of 2019. By Broseph McBrowerson, but everyone calls him Broey. Yeah. Literally, there was conversations with women in sales with the late, great, um, with with uh, with the uh, the amazing... Uh, Lori Richardson, who's now with it, but she took over for um, a, a mentor of mine who passed in 2020, sadly. And um, but there was that, and then there was one other that was hosted by uh, by a husband wife team, and that was it out of like 30 podcasts. And it, so it was this moment of like epiphany of like I could start my own podcast, and oh, probably need to because literally no one looks or sounds like someone who I'd actually want to hang out with ever or do business with in a lot of cases. And that's really changed. I'm so grateful. But really what it came down to was, I didn't feel like there was a podcast for me. There, was the, there wasn't a podcast I could listen to about sales that could help me, that I felt like I identified with. So I was like, all right, fine, I'll start my own. I called up a friend and she was literally going through the same thing at the same time. So we said, screw it, we'll do our own. Like we, we, we were full bender from Future Wrong. We're like, screw it, we'll have our own podcast with liquor and heels and honest conversations about the that happens to us every day and random stuff. It's it's a lot of fun. And we've gone through a few iterations and it's been a long journey. We're about to hit our 100th episode, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, we're the so other side of sales is on a mission to make B2B sales culture truly inclusive so everyone can thrive. So our conversations are all interviews with amazing sales pros who are trying to do amazing things and who are 90, I think, I think we're over 90% are from a minority background which is really exciting to kind of try and shift that conversation from Brosif, Ms. Broerson. Our original tagline was the anti-sales bro podcast, but we thought that was a little too antagonistic. So Yeah, being a little too antagonistic is generally my failure mode. So I hear you on that. I, I really want to thank you for taking so much time out of your day to speak with me. Because, well, not that I should thank you. It's one of those, I should really turn around and say, wait a minute, why aren't you selling things? Why are you still talking to me? But no, I, I do appreciate your... Exactly. I, I, I think that's a different podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. If people want to learn more, where's the best place to find you? Well, definitely please go check out Duckville, duckvillegroup.com. We would love to talk with you about anything to do with your AWS bill. Got a ton of resources on there around how to get that managed and sorted. If you're interested in connecting with me, you can always hit me up at, I'm on Twitter at Ashley at work, which is another deep cut Star Trek reference. 
Um, or you can hit me up at LinkedIn, just search Ashley Early. My name is spelled a little weird because I'm a little weird. It's A-S-H-L-E-I-G-H. And then early, like early in the morning. And links to all of that will wind up in the show notes. Thanks so much for your time. It's appreciated. This has been fun. We'll do it again soon. Ashley Early, head of sales here at the Duckbill Group. I'm cloud economist Corey Quinn, and this is Screaming in the Cloud. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. Whereas if you've hated this podcast, please leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice, along with an angry comment. I'm going to get so many angry comments that I'm then going to get angry that everyone did exactly what I incentivized them to do and die mad about it. <laughs>